Uh, anyway, uh, today I have uh, several topics, in fact, all the topics of the, of the day. Uh, and I'm going to be talking first about uh, internal uh, hazards, then external hazards. Actually, I'm going to make some definitions at the beginning and uh, put them together. But then, first internal hazards and later the externals. Just an overview, as there are many different types of hazards. There's no, no time at all for, even for an individual hazard. We could have a, could be a whole week talking just about internal fires. And then in the afternoon, I have some other presentation related to the requirements for design, and in particular, uh, these aspects of the defense in depth and design station conditions that you will have heard. Uh, during the week and uh, some uh, topics of interest, also the practical elimination of, of uh, large releases. So let me start by this, uh, well, maybe to give you a, a, a background of who I am and so on. I'm uh, currently at the agency. I'm uh, working, I work in different things, but the main uh, field of my work is the development of, uh, of safety standards or the revision of safety standards for design and safety assessment. And in fact, I'm, uh, I developed some of them, but I'm also coordinating this development of revision of all the documents uh, that have been uh, done at the section, at the section of safety assessment. And uh, I was uh, revising the requirements for design and safety assessment after the Fukushima Daiichi accident for taking into account some uh, lessons learned from the accident. And now we are in the process of revising the subordinated safety guides to these requirements. And in particular, for instance, I'm uh, revising the safety guide on the reactor coolant and, and associated systems, which encompass uh, most of the most important mechanical systems at the plant. And also I'm uh, in the process to revise and combine, I will tell you later, the um, uh, safety guides on internal hazards. Um, OK, let me start by trying to understand what this, uh, okay, this is the outline of, of the presentation, what I'm planning to do in this presentation. First time we talk, talk a bit about the definition, what is and what is not an internal or an external hazard. Then I will explain a bit why are they important and why we give them some special consideration. Uh, I will talk a bit about uh, the applicable or related uh, standards of the IEA. Then, of course, because, you know, we cannot talk about all the hazards here. It will be simply too much. There is no, no time. We were going to talk about what is the general approach for designing against internal uh, hazards and uh, for uh, making a safety assessment of internal hazards. And then I, I pick up uh, one, uh, one example. And I pick up uh, the pipe break and, and the flooding. I pick up this one because in some uh, how is easy to understand, and also because it shows the possibility of seeing potential secondary hazard effects that can happen. Because when you break a pipe, it's not only that you originate the flooding. It is also you can have pipe whip, uh, water spray, pigment, and a number of secondary hazards. And this uh, pipe break is the possibility to explain uh, the topic of secondary hazards. And then we may have uh, some time for, for discussion or questions. So let me start by saying or explaining or talking about what is uh, an internal hazard. In the, in the IA safety glossary, we don't have a definition for uh, internal or external hazards. Uh, we speak in the standards about uh, internal or external hazards, but we don't have a definition. The IE safety glossary uh, is not supposed to be a dictionary and they define every word, but uh, of course it should be uh, defining the terms that are used in, uh, across the safety standards. But this one in particular is not, and also the use in the, in the Safety standard is not very clear all the time. Maybe this is the reason why it's not there. What we do have is uh, a definition for an external event. And an external event is there defined as, as, or external events are defined as events unconnected with the operation of the facility or the conduct of the activity that could have an effect 
on the safety of the facility or activity. And typical examples of external events for nuclear facility include earthquakes, tornado, tsunami, aircraft gas. This is the definition we have there. But so that means it's something happening that is not related to the process. But if you think in this definition, you could come, for instance, to the conclusion that an internal fire at the nuclear power plant, in some location of the plant, could be considered by this definition actually as an external event. So the terminology is not clear. It is also not clear in, the, in, uh, in uh, member states. I'm used uh, to the um, US terminology. And there you may see that, for instance, a, an internal uh, flooding at the plant is considered an internal hazard, but an internal fire is not. It's considered an external event. So sometimes it's not clear. Other countries talk about area events, because there are events that happen in some area of the plant. I don't want to try to, in this uh, presentation, to make a unique terminology, because it is not. But I try to explain you the concept. And I'd like to explain you how we use them. So in the requirements for design, we speak about design against internal and external hazards. We don't say events. We say internal and external hazards. Those concepts, however, are not defined. So if you think about uh, the, the meaning of the words, and I have been discussing with several colleagues about this, and also our technical editor, in reality, the hazard describes the circumstances that may lead to an event. For instance, the presence of a combustible material in this room is a hazard that may lead to the fire. But the hazard is the, 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 the combustible material, the possibility that there is, a, there is a fire. The fire is the event. So the hazard may exist or may not, and the event may occur or may not occur. In reality, uh, and in this context, Sometimes these uh, topics are used inter in interchangeable, are taken as synonyms. And uh, this is even done in the IA safety standards and other publications. So this is what I'm going to do. So no matter if we think that the hazard is the circumstance that may lead to an event, have example, the, 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 the seismicity in a region may lead to a number of uh, external events. It's not only an earthquake, it can be a tsunami, uh, it can be a landslide, it can be other effects. We can be thinking, uh, we have several examples. But here, we will consider when we talk about internal hazard or internal or external event, it's the same. So it's at the end, in reality, the event that we're going to, to, to address. Okay. So internal hazards are those, or internally, I don't want to say internal events because it creates another you know, confusion with the initiating events. So the internal hazards originate from sources that are located inside the nuclear power plant, both inside and outside the buildings, but inside the nuclear power plants. And, and the sources may or may not be part of the process. For instance, you can have a, an internal flooding that it is the result of a pipe of a system that breaks, uh, uh, or you can have a fire, which is a, um, a fire on a piece of equipment of the plant, but maybe also the fire is part of a combustible material or some activity, some people is welding or, uh, or something like that, and a fire, a fire starts up. So the source doesn't need to be part of the process, may or may not be. Uh, examples of uh, internal hazard, where well, we have here a list, is not complete, but certainly and the most important uh, is the internal fires. Then we have a pipe whip, internal uh, flooding, maybe related to turbine missiles. Uh, turbine missiles, of course, are related to safety, to, to equipment of the plant, it cannot be something not related to the process. The drop of, uh, of uh, heavy loads, something is being moved in the plant, some equipment, uh, some material, and maybe fall on top of uh, the equipment, and equipment may, may fail. So then we have uh, also on-site explosions. When we talk about explosions at the nuclear power plants, it's normally the result of a, of a fire or uh, another violent uh, phenomenon. But it's not explosions in the, in the sense that um, we have explosives at the plant. 
in principle, explosives should not be at the plant. Yeah? So, it can be hazardous in explosions. But actually, I worked uh, for a while in my past in a, in a company producing explosives. And uh, the, in this industry, they make a difference between explosive, explosive and explosive materials. I don't know if it works in English like this. But the fact is that some, equi some, some, uh, some substances in combination with, uh, with air and some physical conditions explode or, or detonate. Uh, and some of the, uh, but these are not explosive. There's explosives such as TNT or something like this. They really are designed to detonate. They don't need air or something. Like they are much more destructive. So in the nuclear power plant, in principle, there sh should not be any explosives. Explosions are always the result of, I don't know, um, hydrogen, uh, flammable materials, uh, arcing faults, or something like this, associated to some, to some of the phenomena. Now, uh, I'm introducing, yes, so, please. Can I say, as a What? Fuel? What will be the hazard of a, of a spent fuel? What? No, we are not uh, thinking. I will come to, to that. I mean, hazard, if you think, uh, think in, the, in the sense that it can be a source of, of, of danger. But here, when we talk about the uh, hazard, we talk about some harsh phenomena that uh, has the potential to affect all the equipment at the plant and therefore uh, originate at the end uh, be a, a challenge for safety, have the potential to lead to, to, uh, to damage of the fuel and a, a release of uh, some material, of some uh, radioactive material. Mm -hmm. External hazards will be those that take place uh, not inside the, the plant but outside. And, and here there is a huge variety. Uh, this is a very short list, but I put here seismic hazard because seismic can always happen. Eh? It's a matter of uh, what is the seismicity of the, of the plant, of the area. We're coming to that in the, in the presentation for external hazards. High winds, uh, wind-induced missiles, external flooding, many kind of severe uh, weather conditions, including tornadoes, offset transportation. There are many things. You can make a whole list, you can uh, put, uh, I don't know, even meteorites if you want, and uh, aircraft crash, and, and so on. Uh, Vulcanism, well, should in principle not side the plant next to volcanic area, but uh, some countries don't have many choices, so it's uh, something you, places like uh, Japan or maybe Indonesia where they are planning to have a nuclear power plant, things like this cannot be uh, excluded so easily, and actually because some of the phenomena can be far-reaching. If you think, for instance, about the tsunami. Tsunamis are originated, as you know, by, by an earthquake. A tsunami propagates very fast, and, uh, and it is not like you say some of the hazards, well, like, like uh, winds, high winds or, or tornadoes. You are thinking about the phenomena taking place near the nuclear power plant. But a tsunami uh, can be few thousand uh, kilometers away the origin and still uh, has an impact on the, on the plant. Please. So, so. Uh, yeah, thank you. Are you kidding? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Internal flooding will be uh, any source of flooding, a tank, a pipe, that it is inside the, 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 the plant site, normally inside the building, because otherwise it will spread and go away. So it is a, a break of a pipe, an accidental opening of a valve or whatever, uh, that will result in a sufficient amount of water being spread in the rooms of the plant. 
and damaging equipment that are important to safety. But the origin is inside the plant. And external flooding will be when, due to very heavy rains or whatever, the, uh, all the waters go into the plant site or the river level goes up and the plant is eventually flooded. This is an external flooding. The, the, the water is coming eh? internal. Internal will be, as I said, internal flooding. You take, uh, for instance, um, a pipe in the plant that it breaks, gives a sufficient amount of water huh? that maybe is not even detected, and then the, the plant is flooded. Just put an example, you have the fire protection system that normally uh, is a water-based uh, system, and it is in many areas of the plant, and for whatever reason, this, the piping of this uh, system breaks or accidentally is activated, and then the water spreads in the, in the, in the plant and floods several areas. Uh, because in the plant, I see that uh, they have uh, the, the system to drain. The, the, yes. The so that. How? Well, uh, well, 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 this is correct, but uh, then you enter in what is the reason of the draining in the plant. When you go to the plant, you see those draining, and sometimes this drain, which, by the way, can be uh, obstructed and dirty and not always uh, works to the full capacity, these drains are designed for the expected sources of uh, water in this, uh, in this uh, area. So sometimes it is because people is cleaning the area with a hose, sometimes because there is a fire protection system, I don't know if there is a sprinkler here or something like this, is calculated for, for this amount of water, but it's not calculated for a break of the pipe itself. So you have to be thinking. So it always depends on what is the flow. So it's a competitive effect. You put water inside one area, and the water escapes to the drains or through whatever gaps of the doors, and maybe goes to somewhere else where it can also affect. So you have to, you have to be thinking. Yeah? Sometimes also, mm, there's not much water that can be delivered you have to, because it is a closed circuit. Huh? You have to be thinking. At the moment, we are just identifying the, 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 what are the potential or the different uh, internal or external hazards. When it comes to the analysis, those aspects you need to take into account. Okay? Good. So obviously, when you want to deal with all this, uh, this phenomena here, as you can see, uh, uh, you need a lot of uh, knowledge in different areas. Yeah? Even if you take uh, something like earthquakes, it's uh, not just one specialist, because you need a specialist about uh, the, all the ground uh, motions, uh, geotectonics, and uh, all the soil, and so on. But you also need the, 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 the expert in structural design. Uh, so there, it entails uh, different areas of knowledge. And of course, you are not going to find a person that knows about uh, seismic hazards, uh, aircraft crash, and, uh, and, and all, all the topics. So this is, uh, the analysis of hazards is uh, very complicated, and it's really a multidisciplinary team effort. Now, um, why are the internal or the external hazards, why are they important, and when are they important? So these are important, that's what I wanted to, to clarify, because they have the potential to produce a disturbance in the operation of the plant that can lead to an initiating event, and they can also, in addition, this is important, damage equipment, several pieces of equipment, in fact, that may be needed to uh, shut down the plant and bring the plant to a safe shut, uh, shut down condition. They have this, this, uh, this, this potential, and this is why we are, uh, they, they are important. Uh, and if you think something like uh, an earthquake, it, it not only affects the plant itself, it, uh, it affects the, the, the whole area of the plant, so it may even affect the emergency response, it may even affect the, you know, the evacuation of the people if it is necessary, or the, or the capacity or the, the need for bringing resources to, to, the, to the plant. So, one point, I will repeat it several times, and it's, uh, is here, is that the internal or the external hazard, I have a pointer, I think, here. Oh, no, sorry, I don't know why I use this, because I press over the wrong button. So, I thought I had a laser, but it doesn't matter. 
Uh, I come here and I do with my, my <laughs> finger. Does the internal or the external hazard, or even how are you going to call it? I stay with the internal hazard because in the requirement that we say hazard, okay? Doesn't matter. But the hazard is not, oh, sorry. Most likely, so. The one in the, in the top? On the top, yes. Oh, sorry, good. Okay, so. The hazard may lead to an initiating event, and it will lead in many cases. But the hazard is not the initiating event. So, and you will see that uh, the systems are designed against initiating events. Mm? The systems, the cooling systems are designed to provide cooling when something happens, when the normal cooling is lost, when there is a break and the water from the reactor is, is draining and you need to provide water. The emergency power is there to provide power when the normal power has been lost and there is no power from the grid. But emergency power, the cooling system, are not there to mitigate earthquakes. You, you cannot mitigate an earthquake. Those systems are there designed to withstand the effects of the earthquake or to withstand the effects of the flooding or whatsoever. But they are the purpose for the function of this system is to mitigate the initiating events that can be caused by the external event. But the external event is not uh, an initiating event. I know there is a confusion, and uh, in many places, including some IA document, this, uh, this uh, confusion is introduced. But I want to make it clear, this is not how it's in, in our standards, or how we try that it is everywhere in our standards. So, what we have to do is to First, uh, design uh, the plan in a manner that the frequency of the hazard is, is minimized uh, when possible. Sometimes there is not so much you can do unless you move to another place because, I mean, the, an earthquake is an earthquake and, and you cannot uh, minimize the, 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 the frequency of tornadoes. They are there. You simply have to design against them. Yeah? And then uh, what is important is, well, the frequency is there, but then the, the, the plan and the operators need to have sufficient uh, equipment to operate the plan when the hazard occurs and uh, be able to bring the plan to, to a safe shutdown state. And a, a durable situation is not only to, to uh, achieve safe shutdown, but you have to be in this stable situation for a long time, maybe. And so there is a number of uh, the operators, the operating crew itself, and, and a number of minimal number of equipment is necessary to make sure that it's not affected by, by the hazard. This is the whole idea. So I'm coming a bit to the, to the IA safety standards and explaining where do we have the, which requirement we have for the design against uh, internal external hazard. This is in requirement 17. I don't know if uh, in the previous presenters this week uh, came to this point. But, okay, this requirement says that all foreseeable internal hazard and external hazard, we have some examples here, and includes not only the natural ones, but some that are human induced. Uh, and that can uh, affect the plant safety, uh, should be identified and the effects need to be evaluated. When I say human, human induced, for instance, an aircraft crash is human induced. It's not something natural. Then the aircraft crash can be simply human induced, accidental can happen, or can be intentional, malevolent. Can be happen, of course, somebody tries to hit the plant with the aircraft. That, that's another story. We will come to this, maybe. So, these hazards, I put it in red, shall be considered for the determination of the postulated initiating events. You have to think in what are the hazards, what initiating events can create. And they are not going to create an initiating event only, as we said before. They are going to create a load in the plant because of the physical or chemical or whatever phenomena they, 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 they entail. So they generate a load, the load potentially leads to, to failures. So, so, and then, so this uh, 
in potential initiating events and the loads that they generate, the seismic load, the vibration, the forces, should be taken into account for the design of the items important to safety. Now, it's important to identify what are the initiating events that can create because, as I said before, we design then to mitigate initiating events. So if a hazard can create an initiating event that they have not identified, I have a problem. So the hazard is not, or is not the initiating event. The hazard may lead to an initiating event. But I have to be sure that I have considered this initiating event in my design. If the hazard could create some initiating event in addition to those that I have identified, and I, I, I miss it, then we have a problem. So, to be more specific, the requirement says that the design shall take due account of internal hazards, such as fire, explosion, flooding, missile generation, collapse of structures and falling objects, by whip, jet impact, and release of fluid from failed systems. This will be an internal flooding, or from other installations on the site. It's not uh, it's, uh, um, an exhaustive list. There are more. So appropriate features for prevention and mitigation shall be provided to ensure that safety is not compromised. This is what we have in summary in the requirements. We go not into all the details. Associated to these requirements, uh, we have at the moment for the internal hazards two safety guides. We have divided the war into internal fires and explosions. And we have the explosions mainly there because explosions are the results or are combined with fires. As I mentioned before, ex explosives from explosives themselves should not happen at the plant. So very often explosions are linked with uh, fires. And then we have the rest. So uh, sorry, I was the other way around. This is fire and explosions, and this is the rest. Well, uh, this sounds a bit artificial on one hand. Uh, what we're going to do now, this is part of my work, I'm starting this, having a meeting next uh, month. We're going to combine these two guys together, not only combining them together and putting. It's also because we have now new requirements for design. These were developed uh, uh, to provide recommendations on the previous requirements of 2001. So now the, the requirements uh, or the, the practices in the member states for for design, for instance, against fires, are more strict in terms of segregation of the division, separation, protection of trains, and so on. So we are going to uh, revise those safety guides, put them, combine them together, be a, a stronger. Uh, no matter if we combine them or not, I, I, I need to mention that internal fires still is the most important hazard in a nuclear power plant. It deserves special attention. It has it. It has it because we have a systems for fire protection and because there is a fire protection program in nuclear power plants, also the requirements for design give a special consideration to, to, to fires. It does mean fire protection has not the same treatment as the, the, the fall of a heavy loads or something like this from a crane. Anyway, now I said to see how can I describe them all together and see what is in common and so on. And I put this on the perspective of uh, what you have learned and heard, that is the, the defense in depth. The defense in depth approach that is not only nuclear power plants, it comes originally from the military, and it can find application in uh, several uh, areas. So the defense in depth <coughs> approach is here considered as the implementation of consecutive layers of protection. Uh, I, I will explain also later when we talk about defense in depth, this is just not physical barriers. We need physical barriers because this is what works against radiation. But as an approach, it's not necessarily barriers. So how the defense in depth approach translates or can be applied in the context of the internal hazards? Uh, the first thing is to prevent the internal hazard from occurring. Sometimes you cannot prevent it. You cannot prevent an earthquake. It may happen or not, but you cannot prevent it. It will be there. And you cannot also not say, in this plan, there are not going to be earthquakes. You have to postulate an earthquake. Another story is what is going to be the magnitude of the earthquake that you're going to postulate and for which you're going to design. Sometimes you can indeed say there's no hazard. 
because simply if you talk about the drops of, uh, of load, you go into a room, so there's no crane, I have the equipment, what is going to fall? Simply, it's not. Yeah? But in many cases, uh, it's a matter of what is the magnitude. So uh, you will take measures to reduce the, 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 the frequency. I will not go into this point because I'm going to, to explain them later. Just let me maybe perhaps say the points here. This, the second thing will be in the defense approach. When something happens, if I can detect it as soon as possible and take steps to stop this hazard or to control it, it's good. Then, if it happens, sometimes I, I cannot detect it or the detection can be there, but it is not a matter of the design. The design tells me you have to design to make sure that this hazard has a limited impact. So the next topic is to limit the, the impact on the plan uh, and to avoid secondary hazard, avoid the one hazard leads to another one. And finally, when we have control of the hazard, when we have a, a screwed a secondary impact or they have taken into account, we have a damage situation. Finally, the last part is now you have to be able that you, you have to ensure that you can still shut down the plan after the internal hazard with whatever loads or failures have occurred at the plant. That's the idea. And I'm going to try to explain these, these steps of the defense in depth approach for, in general, for all the internal hazards. For some of them, we have a meaning or a strong meaning. For others, we have less meaning. Now, let's go to the first step. Oh, I have some animation here. I didn't know I have animations. The first thing I say that uh, few hazards can be totally eliminated. You can, there are some things, some of them you cannot say they are not going to take place. Please. How early detection is being done in case of internal hazards? It will come to that. You are going to late this. Okay. So first thing is I don't want the hazard to happen. So some cases you can exclude. It depends on the hazard. I say a load where there is not, you don't have a crane, you don't lift or move equipment on top of safety important equipment. Uh, this room is dry. There is, I'm sure, water cannot go inside sometimes. Some of the times it's a matter of reducing the frequency. So you make sure that the combustible materials are not introduced in a very sensitive area. Um, dangerous activities, you don't do welding or something like this. A number of things, or so your control the transient fuels, etc. So there can be also some uh, design measures that, for instance, uh, this uh, circumferential two way that you break a pipe and you have a, a break of to twice, twice the, 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 the size of the section. Something you sometimes apply this design criteria leak before break. So you are allowed by some regulators to exclude this uh, guillotine, double guillotine break. But the point is sometimes you can exclude the hazard, many other times you cannot. You simply work on the frequency. You do your best to minimize the frequency of a hazard of a given magnitude to occur. So how you do, do this is by design provisions, like this uh, leak before break, or by operation provisions. You know, control of uh, combustible materials, uh, control of dangerous activities, control of the barriers, and so on. Uh, oh, let me just move, because I'm, I don't know, the, get rid of the animations. Um, so, for instance, you also can control uh, the, the fire loads in, uh, in, uh, in an area so that uh, they're not so sufficiently big to, to ignite uh, the rest. Uh, you can also do uh, piping inspections, or inspection of vessels. This also reduces the frequency, the likelihood that this uh, pipe will break, and so on. So this is uh, for about uh, the, the, the prevention. That's the first step. So, and this is where you should be working. The best choice for you is to minimize the occurrence of the hazard. That's the best choice. Now, sometimes you can. Huh? Um, and this, this approach can be also applied to the external hazards. So I may be combining talking also about the external hazards. 
Now, the, the second will be the early detection and the suppression. I call it suppression. I don't know if this is the, the best word. The idea is to arrest, to stop the hazard. Okay? So sometimes it's possible to have an early suppression. For instance, the case of the fires, you install five detectors. And as soon as a fire breaks out, you have an opportunity to detect. Of course, it depends on the nature of the fire. There are even some uh, detectors that are very sensitive. You can put some of these, I don't know what is, I forgot now the name. But there are some detectors that are uh, capturing the air from inside cabinets yeah, and have a, make a, an analysis of the air there and they say, okay, there is a sign here that uh, a fire maybe is starting. Those are too sensitive, are normally or cannot be used to trigger uh, automatic uh, fire suppression because you will be water in the plant and have many spurious situations. But it is good for you because you are, you have an early warning that something may uh, be happening and you can check manually. But uh, in other cases, uh, uh, it, it can act. Huh? So the first thing is to see, to detect that something is happening or to detect that the pipe is broken and a, and a, and a flood is uh, taking place and so on. Because if you detect, you react. So, and you stop the hazard as early as you can. But this is not always possible. For example, fire detection and extinguishes this is the most typical thing. Uh, also in, a, in, in civil or in normal constructions, uh, even in hotels. You have your, your fire detection or houses, extinguish it. And then uh, for flooding, I would not call it extinguishing, otherwise suppression is even good, but the idea is to isolate the flood. Of course, if it is talking about uh, the loads, uh, the drop of loads, so doesn't, uh, doesn't apply. It falls, it falls. Yeah? So now you have to be thinking from the perspective of design and the operation that there are different situations. Uh, regarding this subject and detection. Uh, the detection and the suppression can be automatic or, or manual, just to try to maybe explain. So the direct, you can have a detection that it is automatic and direct, this would be, if you have a fire detector, or if you have a, a building and there is a sump in the building, many buildings on the basement have a sump where you collect water, and this will be dry. It should be, and then you have an alarm, and then you say, okay, something's going on. And this is uh, automatic, and it is direct, because automatically I associate that fire detector with a fire, or I associate this water there with the sun, with, with, the, with the flooding. So this has to be careful, because it depends how this, is, uh, how this is set, because maybe, well, it's not just the flooding. I can associate that, you know, simply there has been some water spilled from whatever, some people cleaning or something. But it depends on the room and so on. So, in, But the thing is that the direct detection, because you associate with the phenomena, you can use it for, for isolation or for, for suppression. Then we have uh, also uh, an indirect detection. So we don't uh, uh, detect directly the signs of the, of the fire or the flooding, but we detect the causes, so I may see alarms coming up in the control room because electrical equipment is failing, equipment is malfunctioning, and so on. So you detect that something is going on there, but you don't know directly, okay, this is a, a, a fire, maybe something else, but the operator is alerted. We call this automatic because it is automatic alarm, but it is indirect. So this is not used for any automatic action. And then we have manual detection. And this can happen because uh, the fire or the flooding take place near to or in the place where somebody is working because he may even is involved in the origin. Or sometimes you have people going to do surveillance tasks, uh, people are going at the plan for this or that, and you notice smell or something, you know. So this, of course, is the latest thing. It, it, it doesn't help uh, that much. The advantage is that then you know it's a fire because you see that. So there's no doubt. Uh, and then we have automatic suppression, uh, for instance, for fires, fire extinguishers uh, of different kind, can be water, can be gas, can be foam, whatever thing. 
In case of flooding, there may be, not always, but there may be some actions, automatic or some actions that stop some valves, stop the flooding, and, and so on. This is always triggered by the automatic detection. The automatic actions are not triggered by, by uh, any indirect detection and so on. And, uh, and then you have at the end, of course, also the suppression manually. There's a fire, there's no automatic suppression, but you can either go there, press a button remotely, and, and the water start uh, pouring there, or go with the hose and with the extinguishers, and so on. Uh, this intervention can be remote, as I said, pressing a button, or, or, or somebody has to go there. So this is just an idea, but it's good to mention this thing, but it is also important to say, I will be speaking about fires now, in particular, maybe, that the new designs, of course, in favor, um, promote that you have this detection and suppression. So it's good for your plan. You don't want the fire to, to grow up, and you don't want to lose your equipment, but the design or the justification of the safety of the design is not based on detection and suppression. This can also be not reliable. So the design is based on confinement, which is now going to be this topic. It's based on designing in a manner, you want to ask something? Oh, yes, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it's just based on a design that ensures you that the fire will not spread from a given area. But so those areas sometimes are too big, sometimes are smaller. It's not always possible. But this is now the, the next thing. So how, when a fire or a flood or some other event happen, I think in general, eh, maybe the, fire, the, the drop of loads is not important case. How, when something happens, I can limit the impact on the whole plan? That's the next point of this, call it defense in depth approach. So the first thing is very important, I will say this many times, and uh, is the plan layout. If you want to ensure this thing, it's very important how you construct your plan. Where you put your buildings and inside the buildings, how you subdivide the buildings, how you separate the zones, by which constructive elements with resistance to the hazards, walls, doors, dampers, whatsoever, that are resistant to fire. Huh? And then where I am putting my equipment. So the plan layout is the most important thing. And it has to be considered from all the perspective. It's not the same for flooding as for fires. For uh, flooding, as you can imagine, the water goes always down. So the basement is a sensitive area. The higher parts are less sensitive. For fires, well, we also know that the smoke goes up and so on, but that's not as important as for the flooding. For uh, aircraft crash, you have to be thinking what the aircraft can hit. So there are many implications because you have only one plan layout. And this plan layout has to be good for all the hazards, internal and external. So the plan layout is the most important thing. And uh, you have to design a plant in a way that the equipment is protected. This is one of the reasons we have the nuclear power plants the equipment and everything in buildings. And it's not like a refinery where you go and you see all these distillation towers, tanks, and everything, and they're little buildings. So very important, plan layout and adequate protection features for, for the equipment. Uh, this plan layout, uh, let me just get rid of the animations. <laughs> and then I, I start. First thing, what it's going to do? The first thing is that uh, it's going to help to prevent to the extent possible the postulated initiative event. Hmm? Now, this is not always possible. Uh, sometimes it's, it's, you cannot even exclude. Uh, you are going to be uh, postulated that, that it happens. In, uh, sometimes it even triggers the, 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 the initiative event. I'm now more thinking about the external hazards. For instance, uh, many plants in Japan and other places, uh, when you have an earthquake of a given level, the seismic instrumentation actuates the, 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 the reactor scrum. Yeah? But in other cases, uh, it's not automatic, but they may happen. And actually, a very difficult thing is to justify 
that the plant scram is not going to happen. So if you have a fire in this room, and in this room you have a, a many equipment, many cable trays, and even if these cable trays are not for safety-related equipment, but normal process equipment, it can be very hard to justify that you are not going to have an initiating event and the plant is not going to scram. And also maybe the reactor, the, the operator is going to do it. So, so you, des you design for minimizing the, the initiating event, but it was not always possible to exclude it. Now, the question is, what initiating events you can originate? And uh, AOs, as I said, should be prevented, are likely to happen. AOs are things that you expect to see during the life of the plan, or we think when we design that this may happen. Accidents are something very rare, and we don't expect to see them. So in accordance to this criteria, the design should be such that the internal or the external hazard should not lead to an accident. So sometimes it's not also not possible, but it has to be of a very low frequency. And for instance, a break of a primary system is an accident in itself. Actually, we don't consider this an internal flooding. But uh, you know that uh, the LOCA, the break of a pipe of the primary system, is something of very low frequency. So, and these are um, safety class equipment, and they are designed in a manner that the break is very of very low frequency. The same should happen in um, some other areas of the plant if something could happen and lead to an accident. So, the, the external hazards should not lead to accidents, or very rarely. And when we talk about, uh, for instance, seismic design, the protection of the equipment, the, the, uh, the design, the seismic design of the equipment should be such that an earthquake shall not lead to an accident. Okay. Um, now, how you, uh, this is equipment just itself, but then the question how you prevent that the equipment affects too many components or components of uh, different divisions, and that's where the layout comes. So you have to have separations to prevent that the hazard fails components of several divisions. And this you do either by the physical separation, total segregation of one division with another, with barriers that are qualified for the, the hazard and the consideration, or sometimes you cannot do that totally, and then you have protections around some equipment or less a strong uh, uh, provisions for protection. For instance, there are, that there are places where you cannot really implement a full separation. You cannot have electrical divisions separated in the control room because there where things go together. And when you go near the control room, you have the cable spreading room, and you also it's difficult. Sometimes you get some cable from one cable room in the top, one from the bottom. There are areas where it's very difficult to implement the same level of, of separations or you have the containment, and in the containment, everything is the containment. So in the containment, you start thinking what I put, some electrical penetrations of some division here, the others there, partial walls, component, we see some pictures there, component uh, protected by, from uh, missiles or pipe, pipe, pipe um, barriers and so on. But it's not always possible to achieve the same level of, uh, of protection. And, uh, and this also, this uh, kind of protections prevent uh, the effects from uh, secondary hazards. I like have here the case of the pipe whips, water impeachment, and, and so on. I think I have here some, let me see. I thought I have a picture here, maybe come later about uh, this um, segregation. Now, imagine whatever has happened in your plan, supposedly it's good design, you have not damaged too many equipment, now you have to make sure that the plan can be safely shut down. Okay. So you have now to mitigate the consequences of this AO and additional failures. So what we want to say here is first, you need to ensure that sufficient amount of equipment, 
survives the internal or the external hazard. When you have, I'm going to make a bit of a difference between the internal and the externals. I know this lecture is about internals, but I mentioned the externals as well. When you have an external hazard, like an earthquake, there's no way to prevent that the, that the earthquake shakes the whole plant. The earthquake is going to shake the, the, all the units at the plant and in, in the surrounding. The earthquake shakes everything. The fire is not going to affect the whole plant, not even other units. So what you do with the earthquake is you design the systems against the earthquake. You establish seismic categorization, the most important equipment. You say this is seismic category one. You make sure that the earthquake, design basis earthquake, and even something stronger, doesn't fail this equipment or this structure. So the whole system, by design, can remain fully functional because you design against the earthquake, so everything survives. Uh, for internal hazards, however, you cannot make this claim because depending where is the fire, you cannot prevent one division from failing. I can have a fire in this room and there is no equipment important to safety, may propagate somewhere else, can provide, a, uh, can um, cause a, a, an initiating event, and so on, and I don't fail safety equipment. That's not the most important thing. But if this room has equipments of division one, for instance, electrical division one, and the other room there or somewhere else has division two, okay, I design the walls, the enclosure of this room in a manner that the fire stays here. But the failure of division one cannot be prevented because the fire is here. So the difference between internal and external hazards is that for the internal hazards, the failure of a division by the uh, fire, in many cases, cannot be prevented. You have to buy that you have lost one division. Then you have to shut down the plant with the remaining thing. And then you have to be thinking, can something happen in the other, um, in the other divisions? How many divisions do I have? Is this single failure criterion still in force or not? Is the regulator allowing that a fire takes out the single failure criterion or not? Hmm? It's a bit of controversy there. So what you have to do in any case is a safe shutdown analysis. And for every fire or for every internal hazard in a given location, how to take into account if where the fire or the whatever hazard can be enclosed, what is the maximum damage that it is postulated, then what is not affected, can you shut down with the rest? You have to define what are your safe shutdown systems and make sure that these safe shutdown systems are not affected by the fire or the flood or whatever, or if affected, that sufficient number of redundancies are not affected. That's the safe shutdown analysis. This is just from, let's say, deterministic point of view. Of course, you can also do this analysis taking into account probabilistic considerations. So, uh, that's the part of the four steps of this defense and depth approach. I don't know how far I'm going with the time. I have until 10.30, right? Okay. So, again, maybe to recap, uh, the internal or the external hazard shall not lead to an initiating event for which the plan is not designed. This is very always very important message. Hmm? The identification of the PIE must be thorough when you design and consider potential effects of internal and external hazards. So when you have your internal hazards analysis, when you have your plan, your layout, you have to be thinking if something breaks out here, where it can be enclosed, what can happen. Normally you have these PIEs identified. But if not, you have to include it or do something. I put you an example. For instance, in the in the uh, identification of PIEs, uh, very easily you, or commonly, you take into account, for instance, uh, a mainstream light break. Uh, but this is just one, 
one line, or if instead of a break, a spurious opening of the safety valves. In other words, you depressurize one steam generator from the secondary side. This creates a very fast cooling in the primary circuit. Com uh, missing the word. Changes of the density, you need safety injection. Sudden change. And you design your safety injection, your operation systems for that. Now, you don't postulate that this can happen at two steam generators or two steam lines at the same time. You don't do that, because this is very unlikely. It's not going to happen at the same time. But you may be thinking, what cannot happen like this, maybe an internal hazard can do. So you have to make sure that there is not such a fire or something that provides a spurious opening in both steam generators or an aircraft crash that can hit two steam lines at the same time, something like this. If it can, it has two options. The best one is you prevent it. So you make sure that the cables or whatever for these safety valves are not in the same place, can never be burned together. The aircraft gas cannot hit the two lines because the lines are put inside the building or separate and so on. Either you, you eliminate the potential for this initiating event not considered, or the other option is, now I postulate in my accident analysis an accident that it is the depressurization through two broken lines, which of course has design implications. Yeah? Uh, and maybe it's not even possible. But the point is, it's very important that the internal external hazard cannot produce an initiating event that you have not considered. So the initiating event identification must be very thorough and systematic. Now, in your accident analysis, you model, you take into account the plan response, you use your sophisticated computer codes and analysis to demonstrate that the systems that you have designed in place are sufficient to shut down the plant and uh, meet the acceptance criteria for the fuel, for the pressure boundary, and so on. And you do this with a certain level of conservatives in the analysis of safety systems. So you have to make sure that the effects of the fire don't challenge don't the validity or, 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 or don't invalidate those analyses. The effects should not invalidate those analyses. Now, the operation of safety decision not be, okay, good. Secondary effects, you have to go into, sorry. So, and this, uh, this uh, actually, this uh, PIE analysis, this uh, accident analysis is important because it's also telling you what you need for the PA, what systems you need to, to, to use for safe shutdown the plant. So this PIE analysis is going to help you to define what are the safe shutdown systems, what is the minimal set of systems that you need to prevent from failing after the internal hazard, be flood, be fire, whatever. Now, you do all these things. The question is if the plan is still safe enough or not. Sorry. So as I mentioned before, it's not always possible to prevent a transient, an AO, an anticipated operation occurrence, or maybe the operator will trigger it. The hazard initiating uh, an accident should be prevented to the extent possible by design. This is your goal. You, this actually should not happen. But if it happens, it should be with a very low frequency, with a frequency uh, similar to those of the frequency of um, accidents, of DBA. So this goes in line with, uh, with the, you will have seen probably in previous presentations, there are different frequencies from uh, AOs, accidents, and so on. So the, the lower the frequency, you can be accept more consequences, but if the frequency is relatively high, then the consequences has to be to be low. And important thing is the safe shutdown of the plan has to be always possible. This is the most important thing. 
This is part of the, of the design. This is what you need to ensure. You don't want the, the initiant event to happen, I mean, the, the, the hazard to happen. You don't want the damage. But eventually, the, the, the ultimate goal is to safe shut down the plant. That's not what you want. I mean, this is what you want. You, you want to, you have to demonstrate that you safe shut down the, but also you are an owner of a nuclear power plant. You don't want to have a fire. Say, well, very good. I safe it shut down, but I have lost the turbine and I have lost this thing and now the plant is destroyed. I will never operate or I will not operate in the next uh, four years. You protect your property. You uh, have all the interests. Yeah? But the ultimate goal is to ensure that the plant can be safely shut down. Now, let me put the rest of the animation. I'm recapitulating a bit, so the, 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 the consideration uh, for the hazard, the topic of the, of the first importance is the layout. The layout of the plan, the construction of the plan, where you put your buildings, uh, how you subdivide your buildings, where you place your equipment, how you separate your equipment. This is of capital, this is of the first importance. Um, if the layout is not optimal, then you have to do other things. You need other type of protections. This is not the preferred choice. But sometimes either it's not totally possible to have a layout that prevents everything. Other times what happens is that the plans have been uh, designed with requirements that were not so demanding in the past, where not so much attention was given, for instance, to fires or flooding. And the plants need to refurbish, be refurbished. I, I work in my past in, the, in these topics. Uh, after this uh, Browns Ferry accident, uh, if you remember, it was, I think it was 75, the cave was spreading room fire with uh, several implications. In the, in the US, they established the so-called Appendix R regulation to the uh, design criteria. And so they gave three choices for uh, plants designed against uh, real standards to improve the plants. So either to separate divisions, to, to make sure the divisions are where equipment of different divisions were separated. I think 22 feet or something like this with no combustible materials in between. Or the separated by the best choices, of course, when you have the, the three hours barrier, but this is what is not given. Or otherwise, there were other options like uh, like one hour barrier and automatic detection and suppression and so on. So there were several options given. And, uh, and so what uh, sometimes uh, people had to do is to identify, for instance, where there's some cable trays uh, of one division road through places where there was other division and so on. And the cable races had to be protected with a coating with uh, some blankets or something, qualify for, for, for one or three hours. They use different materials that need to be tested and so on. So in any case, uh, each hazard also depends, uh, has a specific protection. So sometimes things that are designed for uh, fires are good for flooding because, of course, uh, a wall that resists uh, fires resists flooding. But it is not always exactly like this. Sometimes you have a, a, a seal of, a, for instance, for, for, for water, for flooding, that, that step may be sufficient. Depends the amount of water that it comes. And that step may be possible that the water, instead of going here, prefers to go somewhere else. But that step, even if it is not like this, is like this, huh? can prevent flooding here, but it will not prevent the, the propagation of fire. So you have to be thinking, sometimes we have a seal on the wall that it is a, a seal pool for, uh, for, uh, for fire uh, prevention of fire uh, smoke going through or fire effects. And it's fine for that but the water will go through. Actually, when you have, one of the things, when you, have, when you put water in a room, the water finds all the ways to propagate. And you will be amazed how many ways are there that were sometimes not taken into control. So uh, the, the total failure of a system important to safety that is designed to accomplish one of these uh, fundamental safety functions control of reactivity, uh, removal of uh, decay heat, 
and, and, and confinement of uh, radioactive material is not acceptable. So these fundamental safety functions mu must be always uh, preserved. Yeah? Even if the system accomplishing them uh, is not uh, uh, required to actuate following the hazard. Now, what I was mentioning on the layout for the new plants, the, 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 what you call is uh, for a good uh, segregation, uh, what you want is that make sure that uh, the, the fire or the internal event cannot affect several, uh, several divisions. That's the preferred way. Not, you can implement uh, detection and suppression, uh, but uh, the design is based on the on the confinement of the hazard to um, limited areas. You subdivide the plant in the in so-called fire areas, and then sometimes these areas are too big, and you also realize that the fire cannot, maybe if it breaks in one corner, accept the, uh, uh, affect the, the, the whole area, so sometimes the analysis considers some smaller subdivisions. I'm putting here one example of the containment because it is of uh, maybe particular importance. Containment is a place where you cannot uh, segregate the, the divisions very clearly. Uh, in the buildings around the containment where you put the, uh, the, the safety system, the emergency core cooling and so on, the electrical building, you can make sure that one division is in one room, the other division is in the other room, well separated and so on, or sometimes you have the containment and around the containment, you have one emergency core cooling division here, the other one here, the other one here, the other one here. So really separated by, 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 by distance and barrier. When you go inside the containment, that, that separation is not fully, cannot be done like this. Of course, it cannot be seen here, but you make sure that if you have here division A, the electrical penetration will be somewhere here, the mechanical penetration somewhere there, but not one that can affect the other, and then the electrical penetration of all the buildings or for instrumentation will be somewhere else or not. You make some, uh, some uh, separation, but as you see, the separation is by, by distance. It's not, you, you cannot claim that everything burns here and everything, because then in that case, you affect all the divisions. Yeah? So what you do here, let me take distance because otherwise I cannot maybe explain. I, I put this picture in horizontal and in vertical to show different type of protections against, uh, against uh, hazards. So you have a missile slab here in case that something happens inside the reactor or breaks. You see the steam generators are uh, surrounded by, by, by walls. So you don't want any kind of break of a pipe uh, that uh, to be affecting other structures. You, this is also a double wall containment, by the way. But also, if you see inside the containment, it's not very visible. But uh, you want to make sure, in, in other words, you want to make sure that some hazard happening here doesn't affect everything. If you look, for instance, at fire protection, the most important fire loads in the, in the containment are, on one hand, the main coolant pumps. Let me see, this should be maybe a, a main coolant pump. I'm not sure, I think so. Uh, they have a, a nice amount of oil, so, so there is assistance normally for uh, collecting the case of break, uh, collecting the, the, the oil of the, of the pump to make sure that not the oil intervenes in the fire and so on. The pressurizer has its also the heaters inside the pressurizer has also a heavy lot of cables around and so on. So this is for fires and, and for all the uh, flooding or pipe breaks, I will call them pipe breaks, this is the place where you do the most thorough analysis against all the forces that uh, take place after the break, pipe whip and so on. We will be dealing with this later on. So there, are, and you do everything there, from supports, from structures preventing a pipe whip, from structures preventing the, the impact of, a, of a one piece uh, of equipment on another, and, and so on. But if you want a, a total physical separation, is, is not given because the, the environment is, uh, is the same. So you can not say that uh, a, a fire or the effects of the fire, the smoke is going to, or the steam is going to, of course, be everywhere. So in that case, the second option is qualification. So the equipment here should be qualified to be 
withstanding the effects of high temperature, uh, humidity, and so on. So the instrumentation inside the containment, for instance, has to be designed for, for the, the conditions uh, caused by, by, by a locker. Now, protections uh, against uh, of equipment, of uh, I mean, structural safety and components that are important to safety. Uh, generally, uh, most of this equipment cannot be and are not designed to withstand all the causes of the external hazard. Um, but, I mean, this is too expensive, yeah? So when you do the, your... Um, you cannot design a plan in which everything is designed seismically or that all the equipment is protected uh, against everything. This is prohibitively expensive. So what you, what you do is uh, you need to protect those things that are necessary for safety. And you uh, protect this by, by appropriate layout, we mentioned, if not by distance, or by um, uh, protections around some specific uh, kind of equipment. In the picture you saw before, there are some uh, protections against missiles, barriers, and so on. And otherwise, when you cannot protect, is what I mentioned just before also, you have to qualify the equipment for this uh, harsh environment that uh, is produced by, by, by the hazard. So I'm waiting here instead of there. So the other important point is the limitation of the, of the effects. You have to make sure that there is no so-called a domino effect. It is already enough to have one internal hazard or one external hazard. You don't want the internal or external hazard cause something else. So this is very important. This is what you, not always uh, easy, but very important. So the case of the pipe break we will talk about, you have to be uh, particularly in the break, of course, of a high energy pipe. You have to have sufficiently well-designed uh, supporting structures uh, or to have uh, so division walls and so on to make sure that the break is not impacting other pipe and creates another break and, or, or is impacting other equipment, equipment, electrical equipment, whatsoever, and providing some additional failures. So this also, if you look from the perspective of the external events, uh, and as it has been seen uh, from this uh, Fukushima accident or, or this, uh, this Tohoku earthquake, better said, because it affects several plants in, the, in Japan, you can have a, uh, an earthquake that can trigger a flooding or can trigger a fire. Mm -hmm. This happens when uh, you don't have, for instance, the, the, the adequate qualification. Many plants, you have uh, systems that are not seismically designed. So fire water protection system, for instance, not seismically designed. Many plants, you can have an earthquake. The earthquake breaks the fire protection system. The water is released, you have a flood. So all these things should be, uh, should be uh, taken into account to ensure the safe shutdown of the plant. And the main point is that the hazard or the combination of hazard should not uh, uh, lead to the common cause failures of all the divisions of the safe system and so uh, uh, prevent the safe shutdown of the plant. And this is normally accomplished by, by, by physical separation. Uh, this I mentioned before, in the, in the mitigation, sometimes you credit mitigation, regulator sometimes allows to credit mitigation uh, for instance, in fire uh, protection, detection and suppression. Generally, however, for new plants, it's good to have detection and suppression of fires, but the approach taking is confined the confinement principle. So in the design, this is not credited. What it is credited is the physical separation of the divisions to make sure that even if everything burns in this area, is not uh, uh, propagated to the to their other redundant divisions. The hazards resulting from a PAE have to, can, the PAEs, I mean, created by a hazard and the associated failures uh, should be such that never the, 
the envelope considered in the analysis of the PIE is exceeded. And the message I always said before that uh, the internal hazard cannot lead to any PIE. I don't call it PIE, I call it initiative M because it will not be postulated. It cannot lead to something that it is not postulated in the design. It has to be a PIE. So, uh, these are all for the, let's say, the design part, if you want. But at the end, after the application of all these measures to this, for design, you need to have an analysis, a safety assessment, deterministic, uh, of course, and sometimes also taking into account probabilistic consideration to demonstrate to the satisfaction of the regulator that all these provisions for layout, for protection of the equipment, for privation of PIEs, etc., that are sufficient and that the level of, uh, of uh, safety achieved by the plan for internal hazard or for external hazard is sufficient. So you need to have a, an analysis of the generated PIEs and additional failures that can be caused by the, all these uh, scenarios, flood scenarios, uh, fire scenarios, and so on. And you have to prove that for all them, the radiological consequences are kept below the limits, hmm? those that are upset uh, by, by the design, also for initiating events. Uh, the, you have to demonstrate that the operation of the reactor is possible and uh, the reactor, the reactor being operation being can be operated to bring the plant to a safe shutdown and maintain it there. And you have to demonstrate that uh, the hazard cannot cause the failure of all the redundancies of the system that are required, required for this safe shutdown. Now, sometimes, uh, to gain the knowledge of all the specific actors aspects for the design is very difficult, but you don't have many options when you are designing. But when you do construct or when you do have a plant, you have the option to do a plan wall down. And this is very important because uh, there you capture things specific, things that can only be observed in the reality and also you can design in a plant, but the reality can change tomorrow because you can, uh, uh, believe it or not, uh, small changes that can take in a nuclear power plant relating to door, door gaps, penetrations, and so on, something like this, can be important for the effects of the, of the hazards. This change. So and it is important to make sure uh, to verify all these small constructive elements uh, about the confinement of the hazards and so on, and also make sure that we are doing the operation of the plant, those uh, provisions are, are maintained. I need, I need to run, I have a bit uh, uh, used my time. I'm going to be saying about something of, of uh, pipe failure and associated to the, to the flood. I took this uh, as generic because it, it, it gives the opportunity to combine to, and to see several things that can happen from the, from the pipe failures. So the first thing, pipe failure is something generic, can happen everywhere. It's not something you can exclude. But of course, you can postulate failures of pipes everywhere but not all the pipes are going to break in the same manner, with the same frequency, with the same consequences. So you need some rules, you need some methodologies. I'm referring there, for instance, to the US, to the branch technical position 3.4. So you're going to say, what, where do you postulate and when, which type of breaks, and so on. Okay. So, um, the idea is you have to take into account the possible positive initiative events. We said you have to take into account the systems that are required to mitigate them. They should not be very filled by the hazard. And then uh, you should not create by the break uh, a secondary uh, internal hazard that will aggravate this, 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 this uh, PAE. Yeah? And, the, and the main three safety functions has, has to be accomplished. So where do you postulate the, 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 the breaks? If you see, for instance, this US methodology. So it depends on the pipe. What is the energy of the pipe? What is the, the pressure inside? What is the temperature inside? What's the diameter, stress value, etc. There are a number of things. So if you distinguish low energy and high energy pipes. So for low energy pipes, uh, you say, OK, there's going to be just leaks. 
because there's low energy, it's not a big problem. High energy pipe, uh, then you make a difference between where there is some qualification uh, for preclusion of, of the brake, leak before brake, and so on. So to distinguish there's going to be circumferential brake or not, and so on. And then also the, 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 the locations where uh, you postulate the brake depends on the energy and the size. So I, I will not go into the details, but uh, so there's generally a deterministic approach and say, okay, for piping of less than this diameter, uh, and if it is not nuclear class, it can happen in any location. If it is a pipe, which is a quality grade, I mean safety class pipe and something, I postulate that the break can happen on this place, like the connections, the weldings, and so on, and otherwise, so here and there. So we postulate where the break can take place. Then we uh, postulate what can happen. So what can happen is if a high energy pipe is, is the pipe whip. This is if the pipe breaks totally. If, the, if it doesn't break totally, there is no whip. But if it is, then you have to be thinking what are the, the effects of the, of the pipe whips. And you have to identify what could be the targets of the pipe whip, what you can break. So then you have to uh, protect the, against this pipe whip. I will not stop because I don't, I will not finish the presentation. The next effect that you have to be taking into account is not only the whip, is the impingement forces. So what forces uh, in which direction uh, are going to be affecting, there's going to be a jet of water projected against uh, other uh, equipment. So is the equipment sensitive to these forces? What can happen? And so on. So have to be this is very important, particularly in the containment. For the local analysis, this is explicitly all these effects taken into account. The next thing you have to be taking with the break are the, the reaction forces. Hmm? When the break, when the things are escaping, very fast from from, uh, from from a system. So this has to be taken into account for designing the support of the equipment, the anchoring, and etc. cetera. Uh, all of this needs uh, very sophisticated uh, uh, mechanical and hydrodynamical uh, modeling. Uh, next one will be uh, pressure wave uh, forces and, and forces of the, of the flow. Uh. This is considered in the, in the primary system, also in the pressure vessel, in the steam generator, how these affect the tubes, and so on. Um, and uh, then, uh, other thing to consider is the build-up of pressure. If there's a, an area where the, the, the water or the effects of the water cannot escape, put the containment, maybe other rooms, you will build up pressure, so what is the, 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 the effect? This is also used for the design of the containment. Then you're going to produce humidity, temperature, radiation when the pipe that you break contains uh, material that it is uh, activated or is radioactive. All these things have to be taken into account on the environment produced on the operator if it's not uh, the containment and so, uh, so on. So all of these are factors. Unfortunately, I don't have the time to give some more detail. The message is, is not just the pipe break. The pipe break is something that's going to be produced. It's the last one. It's the flooding. The water is going out. And you have to see now what happens with the water. But in addition to the water, to the flooding, you have to make sure that you don't destroy more things because of all these mechanical effects. So you have to prevent these secondary uh, hazards. So now we have the flooding. Now we break a pipe. And independently of any, any of these things happen or not, pipe whip or no pipe whip, imagine we prevent the pipe whip. But now you have water running out. And the amount of water can be small and not sufficient to damage equipment or will escape here and there. Then I don't care. It's not that important. But it can be massive. It can be even connected to the sea, to the river, or to a, to a, to a pool, or, or simply there is a pump, like the fire water protection system, and it's running and it's going to give you as much water as you can. And uh, so this has to be taken into account. So now you have to be uh, thinking uh, what is going to happen. This is a recap on the, on the uh, pipe break and uh, things that they need to be considered or not, depending on the characteristics of the pipe. But now I'm going to go to the, to, the, to the flooding. So the flooding, it can be the break I just described. It could be sometimes not a break, but any unintentional opening of a valve is spurious opening. Uh, a maintenance error that something was left open where it should not, and something that the operator uh, triggers uh, uh, unintentionally uh, a flooding. Then when there is flooding somewhere, you need to identify the flood sources. You need to identify what you can wet, what you can damage. This is normally by formation, but it can be also by spray and other, and other effects. 
So you need to see how much water you need to deliver in some place to damage the, the, the equipment. And then here, there are competitive factors. This was the question I was asked at the beginning. You put water in some place, the water will propagate. Oh, I'm going to be taking a picture. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, so you release water in some place, the water finds out all the places to go. And it will propagate, and it will create damage where you are, where the uh, flood is taking place, but also in some other areas. So this is very important because I will give you some example maybe later on. We have time maybe at the end, not now, about some funny propagations of flooding that uh, were not expected. So I think I'm going to move. Uh, detection is sometimes possible. Sometimes there are some detectors in some rooms, some indications that may lead you to understand that something is, uh, there is like a, like a, um, a flood, but it's not always possible to associate it to the break. Yeah? And sometimes you may associate, but you cannot show. For instance, imagine that you 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 break um, a fire um, a fire water protection system, and you detect the flooding, but uh, the operator may not be sure if this has been an actuation of the uh, of the uh, protection system triggered by somebody or triggered by some detector or something. So it may not be immediately stopping the pump of the fire because maybe thinking this is the due actuation. So at detection and uh, isolation of flooding is not uh, so straightforward. And um, yeah, what's going to happen, of course, can it be eventually triggered in a PIE and it's going to damage equipment. This is what uh, is relevant. And what you're going to do is you're going to go in the different areas of the plant, see what can break. You have the sources. You have the place where it, uh, where it uh, can be flooded. You have the equipment which is there. You see where the water can go. And this gives you a scenario. So source, uh, rate of flooding, surface are going to flood, propagation, and equipment there. And then you calculate all this flooding propagation and see what it can happen and what cannot happen, and then you have to make sure that you have shut down the plant with this. I have a list here of floods occur in some uh, nuclear power plants in the in the in the plant, just to make sure that I mean to to, to make the point that these things happen. That it's not only uh, I will not go on them. That's the picture that maybe uh, describe the analysis process. Maybe to come back on them. So first you have to get the plan information on the layout and everything, maybe sometimes on work down, to see what is where and so on. Then you have to see where are the sources, uh, so what things can be a, a source of flooding or not. There you have to take into account what is the, what is the potential. Yeah? It, is a, it is a balancing in how much water it can be released, how quickly, and how much water is necessary to damage equipment. If there is something small, you may say, okay, this is not a flood source because that's not much water can be released or not sufficient or can go into the drain. Uh, then the frequency is another story, how frequent this, this can occur. I will not talk on that. And then uh, if you have the equipment, then uh, you see what can happen, what can know, where we can go. And then there is some, sometimes there's some screening and say, okay, here nothing can happen or this can happen, but a quick calculation is sufficient for me to say, that can happen, and I can handle this, or, or that can happen, and uh, and with uh, this rough analysis, I'm happy. I don't need to spend more efforts in the analysis. I'm sure that the contribution to risk is not uh, not important uh, because all these analysis take a lot of time and, and, and resources and money and so on. Sometimes it's not like this. And you need to do some more detailed analysis uh, with the verification by work done and some hydrodynamic calculations. But the best thing is that you are here, because this tells you that the plan is well designed. Huh? And eventually, you can also go and do uh, a risk analysis, come up with uh, probabilistic numbers if you take into account the flood evaluation frequency and possibilities for isolation, and, and you have a PSA model to see what is the probability of safe shutdown the plan with the damage occur. That, that's the idea. I think this is uh, just uh, saying a bit uh, the things that you need to know, sources, ways of mitigation, barriers that prevent the, the, the connections and so on. Had to be looking at all the penetration. I haven't seen the external hazards later on, some picture where you see some uh, unexpected propagation. 
and, and so on, sorry, I'm in the press accidentally, and so on. These are basically the steps, and, uh, and then this leads to the, these things, uh, identification, flooding sources, flooding zones, and so on. That could be a, an idea in a picture of uh, an, a scenario, generic one, in which you have an area, to th three, four areas involved. Imagine your source is in this area, in this room, and it can propagate to this area back and forth, maybe through a door gap or something else, put the door. Uh, in this area can be a drainage that goes here to some area in the basement where there is a sump pump that takes outside. Uh, and here this one may be propagated with this one, here there is a drainage, something like this. So, so you can, you get, what are the rooms involved? What are the propagation paths? Sometimes there's a step like this, and it only propagates as it goes above and something. So you do your modeling, and at the end you can come up with the result that here I get five, mil five centimeters of water, here I get two, or here I get 20, whatever. If I get 20, okay, I have this equipment, and that's a breaker, and if it goes here, nothing happens, but if it goes here, it's going to, the whole bush bus is going to fail. But those things have to be ca very careful because, you know, the flood is not always nice. It can be some big wavy, it can be moisture, moisture can affect the equipment. You have to be, have adequate uh, basis to support your assumptions. The best thing is when your design is such that this will not get wet. Yeah? That's the best thing, but nevertheless. So this is the kind of analysis you do, and here I think this is the last thing. And I have minus five minutes for questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>